All right, we're going to reconvene and start with the third session, um, which is titled Global History Versus the Canon, although I'll propose maybe right away we could start with the premise that it's global history and the canon um, and just be discussing both of these aspects of architectural knowledge and pedagogy and, and so on. And then we can, in discussion, maybe collectively determine the degree to which it's a versus, the degree to which it's um, a kind of collaborative uh, relationship between those two. And very, very, very briefly, our two panelists, Erica Nijinsky, who you know as professor of architectural history here at the GSD, uh, whose research focuses on Baroque and Enlightenment architecture, and who is, of course, the author of Sculpture and Enlightenment, uh, numerous other essays, publications, uh, and the uh, recipient of an enviable number of uh, prestigious and luxurious fellowships over the years. Uh, and then on my right, Ezra Akjan, who is assistant professor of architectural history at Cornell in the College of Arch Art, Architecture, and Planning there, um, whose work uh, includes her book, Architecture and Translation, Germany, Turkey, and the Modern House, uh, as well as a co-authored book with Sibel Bozdegon, uh, Turkey, Modern Architecture in History, um, and a upcoming book, upcoming still, on urban renewal of uh, Berlin's immigrant neighborhoods. Um, we'll begin with Erica first, and then turn to Ezra. Um, so I'm going to actually, I, I have a few loose thoughts. I do not have a formal presentation. Um, and I'm going to try to get through them. And I think then I'll be able, in a very happy way, to turn the table towards Ezra, who will have a far more profound discussion of this problematic, mm -hmm. in large part because when Antoine asked me to speak about the canon, I had a panic attack and then uh, was absolutely horrified to be asked to present an argument for the canon, because I don't really have an argument for the canon. Um, yes, I'm a Europeanist. Uh, it has taken me about a decade to understand that uh, Therefore, I can be accused of being canonical. Uh, but um, in fact, uh, I have to start with a personal story, which has to do with the uh, trauma of trying to get my first book published. And I, you know, what I have behind me is really eye candy more than anything uh, uh, systematic. But my book included my first book included images like this, uh, with sort of images of the people from the French Revolution killing off kings, and if they were burned and didn't die, they got hit over the head with a Herculean club. This is not canonical at all, and. Uh, I received, I remember receiving a letter from a publisher who had summarily uh, uh, rejected the manuscript, in fact, emphasizing the fact that I was not canonical um, and that my, you know, my interests were really so far afield, even though there I was working on uh, the Enlightenment, uh, uh, the, the invention of res publica, architecture, monumentality, political discourse, secularization, but somehow this was uh, really not a proper uh, thing for a manuscript. At any rate, uh, this, this is a way to begin. And I wonder about canons and surveys as a kind of misnomer, because actually in design schools, it's not exactly what we do. We don't actually teach the canon. Um, uh, I have uh, I have in the past taught the canon. I taught it at Michigan. Uh, I was involved in that course when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, um, and certainly at MIT. Uh, there, uh, in in all of these circumstances, it was called by the students often caves to graves, and people would come in uh, in in the middle of the day. It was usually uh, in Michigan, at least it was uh, held at noon, and the room would go dark, and indeed half the students would fall asleep, um, and we would trot through caves to graves. Um, I remember too Hal Foster years and years ago teaching this at Berkeley. And there was a student who would typically fall asleep in the front row. And one day, he, he just got so enervated at this fact that he stepped off the podium, off the stage, and stood there for five minutes looking at the student who was sound asleep and then screamed, you can sleep when you're dead, and then walked back to the podium. So you know there is the canon. Um, and it's interesting because I was sort of, a I guess, a, a graduate student um, when the issue of, of uh, questioning the survey 
uh, came up, uh, and this idea that one would string together masterpieces, that it really was a kind of hagiography, um, a celebratory hagiography of the sacredness of certain works, and the whole thing was a kind of um, sequence of superlatives. Uh, and uh, this was a real concern uh, in, in the 1990s, before also, that somehow this chronology was a production of the masterpiece. And the concern in the thinking of the survey, as one critic of the whole business put it, quote, the notion of the survey is tied to the authority of the panoptic gaze and the privileged perspective the dagger went through. Um, and the opposite, you know, it, as time has gone on, there have been other kinds of efforts. And I was talking to Ezra uh, last night, and at Columbia, she participated in the great books uh, uh, sequence. And we'll hear about that. My mother did as well. Uh, it really takes it back. But its opposite might be here, at least the course that was initially configured by Neil Levine, mm -hmm. called Landmarks of Architecture. And this is a different kind of tack, um, I will say that it suffered, and this is again, this is not where scholarship is, this is where pedagogy still is in many places, not everywhere. Uh, and again, I think Ezra will have more to say about that. But in, we are still at the place, it seems to me, where you have a dizzying arbitrariness. Um, one week you get the Taj Mahal, the next week you get the Crystal Palace. Uh, and I, I will say, though, that the key to the success of Neil's course, and that this has changed more recently as it's gone under the sort of guidance of, an, uh, of others since Neil stepped down. But the success of Neil's course, uh, despite the arbitrariness, was the fact that he policed um, the, the conceptualization of the lectures. We were responsible not for one lecture, but two. And what he asked us to do was to move from an assigned case study or a particular project in one case, and then uh, the next lecture was an extrapolated theme. So it allowed for a kind of, uh, I'll return to this, a synchrony and a kind of diachrony um, in a, paired, uh, a pairing of lectures. And it seemed to me that at least uh, in a, with a particular lecture, it allowed for a kind of uh, dialectical thinking to which the students could be repeatedly exposed as we moved around the globe. However, I will say that all our assigned case studies were in some sense canonical. Um, which means that obviously global and canonical went together uh, to go back to Timothy's point, that they were not necessarily anton antonyms. Um, but what has always concerned me about the way these courses have been taught at the institutions with which I've been associated, and I think there's a lot of work been, uh, that's been done to change this, uh, but I'm still a little bit at a loss, is the fact that you do lose historical narrative. Um, and the, the big question is, in design schools, how much do we need historical narratives? That's an, a different issue. But the, the confusion um, this causes is really interesting because as you watch generations of students come up, at this point, I guess I would draw the line at about 1980, maybe 1990, that anything that happened before then is all leveled. Uh, so that the building of the Blue Mosque and John Ruskin's theories of ornament, they all operate at sort of the same <laughs> historical uh, sort of uh, in the same historical ether, there's no differentiation, there's no, this is to me a, a, a kind of crazy situation and, and antagonistic in fact to my pleasure in understanding pr the praxis of history. This is where uh, I, 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 I sort of have trouble. But back to my point, we don't actually teach surveys, at least not in this design school. Um, the classical, the, the sort of closest animal in this regard and I think there's ways we need to think about this is the notion of precedent and the, the historiography of precedent. And it's the way it has been deployed at various points in the pedagogy of design schools. But the fact is that in schools like this, students do expect not the survey, not the canon, but somehow an adumbration of history and theory. And that's really the issue for the design school. Um, so I, I sort of have three talking points. If I run on too long, I was going to end asking some questions from you about buildings text contexts, which we're always sort of revisiting. Uh, but if I, you know, if I run on too long, I won't. And we can save that for the uh, discussion. Um, oh, it's actually here, right. Uh, so the dreaded term canon. <laughs> uh, what is the canon? It's 
codified law, canon law. It's a body of rules, <coughs> principles, standards that are somehow accepted as axiomatic um, and universally binding a field of study for better or worse. Uh, it devolved um, really uh, after the war, I would say, into uh, the idea of the canon as another word for official. Um, which brings it into an interesting institutional context. Um, even more up to the present, and this I get from my son and his friends, is that the term now is used to distinguish between an official storyline and uh, fan fiction. There's the canon or the canonical text, and there's the fan fiction on which it is based. At any rate, really, I think the etymology is more interesting than the definition. Uh, it, it comes from Greek and Hebrew, and it's a uh, a, me a cannon, a measuring rod. It's a rod, it's a gauge, it's akin to a reed. Um, and uh, it, it means, uh, as one person, as one scholar put it, it means something straight, something you try to keep straight, you try to keep straight. Uh, hence also a rule or something ruled or measured. And uh, there's something very architectural about that. There's something about the meter about that. There's something about the module embedded in that that um, is fascinating to me. Um, but to sort of switch to the question of the global, it intrigues me that when we turn to, um, why, why do I keep doing this? Um, when we turn to what really sort of, uh, and as someone who taught at MIT and I know Mark well, when he turned to the project of the global history of architecture, I can't help, with this definition of the canon in mind, the read, the thing you keep straight, turn to his introduction where he starts right off the bat, what is a global history of architecture? There is, of course, no single answer just as there is no single way to define words like global history architecture. Nonetheless, these words are, completely, are not completely open-ended. They serve as vectors, dare I say straight lines, dare I say canons, reads, keeping things straight, that have helped us construct the narratives of this volume. Um, so global history has vectors that construct narratives but of course we all know that, that the work of the historian is never a straight line, ever. Um, and I, you know, for example, I'm, I'm gonna say that I am fairly incapable, uh, and this is no doubt my, my weakness as a scholar, of doing justice, say, to the history of uh, the traditional Chinese sky well, apart from stating that in its purpose it resembles something like an ancient Roman impluvium, uh, all the while acknowledging the complete arbitrariness of such a statement. And unfortunately, I think that in, uh, in global, the way at least they have been taught in some of the institutions that I've been involved in, and this is where I think we really do need to uh, uh, try to learn from what Ezra will tell us, that you know th this is not useful. <laughs> um, so when you look at the introduction to Mark's book, what you notice is sort of a date. Um, and uh, he starts from the beginnings of Chinese civilization, 3500 BC. He ends with postmodernist museums and Magni House. And you'll have sort of a date and 100 items underneath, each of which have a page or two devoted to them. So everything that happened, say 3500 BC, again, I have to say, gets flattened. Um, and this is, this is a, an interesting factor because that book has been so important and so uh, sort of as a, as a kind of uh, launching pad for forcing us to rethink the way we teach history and theory. Um, but taken as a whole, what's so fascinating to me is, as someone who comes out of the late 17th century and the 18th century um, is, is this sort of tyranny of the list as a replacement for history, the, almost the cabinet of curiosity effect of the list, um, and that this is replacing our notion of what thinking historically might mean. Um, the other thing, and this goes back to some of the things that were said this morning, has to do with uh, how this, this kind of table of contents maps onto digital culture itself. That in fact, it's offering up sound bites. It's like an internet. It's internet-like. If the uh, if the MOOC is like a textbook, well, here the textbook 
is like the internet. I mean, it's it's fascinating to see this, you know, sort of shortening soundbite, two pages, one pages, one paragraph on that Hotel des Invalides, one paragraph, you know, as you move across the globe. So my question then, is this really a history? Is this a history? Um, and this is where, well, <laughs> did it again. This is where I think the canon is. The canon is a mausoleum, anonymous mausoleum, sinking in a pool of travertine in Turkey, uh, sort of disappearing under the weight of its own matter. I love this photograph. Uh, but really, uh, so as the canon sort of gets fossilized, um, the one person I have found who's written really compellingly on the question of the global to me, um, and I think she's sort of uh, done some extraordinary work, is an historian. Um, this is Lynn Hunt. Uh, Lynn Hunt, uh, who published Writing History in the Global Era. And this is exactly the kind of question she asks. What is, what, what is historical praxis as we, we enter, on, enter into, take on the notion of the global? Now, Lynn Hunt is an historian of the French Revolution. Another happy coincidence. She was also the reader of my book. Second, happy coincidence. Uh, she also wrote an extraordinary book on the invention of human rights, tied them to the rise of the novel, written by women, and the notion of empathy, and the way that empathy then, through fiction, became a kind of discourse in political philosophy. Um, she is a great advocate of the Enlightenment and of what we may call Enlightenment humanism. Humanism is a bad word these days, but I use it anyway. Uh, over and against a certain legacy of Frankfurt School philosophy. Um, and here she is in her new book asking the following. No, five minutes. Five minutes. It's great. I won't get to BTC. Um, she asked the following, is globalization a new paradigm for historical explanation that replaces those criticized by cultural theories? Or is it a Trojan horse that threatens to bring back old paradigms rather than offering a truly new one? And I actually think that the implication of canonical, well, what's the canon here? What's the canon there? What, what do we choose? Is precisely where it gets regressive. So this is a, a question. But central here for Hunt is the crisis of her own discipline. And uh, first, uh, you know, her, in her first book, one of the things she showed was the kind of embrace of history, kind of open-endedness, both of data-receptive sociological models and of cultural studies, particularly visual culture. So she was an historian who reached out both ways. Um, and this is exemplified in her 1984 book, uh, Polit Politics, Culture, and Class in the French Revolution. Second was an evaluation that unfolded around this book and other books, uh, Tilly and others, in, in the decades that follow. And this is where the parsing and crisis of history itself happened. First, there is history. The study of the past, you can go back to sources even in 1155, where history is understood, quote, as the chronicling of events that are meaningful to people. What is meaningful to you? Second, historiography. What's historiography? It's the study of the methods and interpretations uh, of history and in history. So example, Francois Furet uh, interpreting the French Revolution. We know, uh, we can hear uh, about how Tocqueville uh, interpreted the French Revolution to, down to Jean Jaurès, right? This sort of how do people interpret those meaningful events through time? There's historicity. Historicity is opposed to mythology. What is historicity? It it's, speaks to the quality of belonging in some authentic sense to history, not to myth, not to orality, uh, not to, not to the, the sort of literary world. H yet historical narrative is a question we have to come back to. Historicism. What's historicism? Maybe the premise that the social and cultural occurrences are determined by a specific historical context. So this is the question of context, not of this. Um, or worse yet, new historicism, which I've been accused of practicing, and I never know whether to parse that as an insult or a compliment. I think it's right. But so that's, this was the, the sort of crisis of history. And I'm not sure that the, the kind of global narrative that Mark offers in his book really even begins to pay heed to that. Um, third, the sense that with the growing rejection of various analytical frameworks, uh, ranging from Marxism, Marxian interpretations, those focused on the processes of modernization. Uh, the Annals School is important here, 
or identity politics, globalization stepped into the void, she says. And she writes, quote, it's a kind of call to arms. Historians need to contest the terrain it now claims, she writes, using the tools held out by the cultural theories while remaining mindful of their limitations, end of quote. And I think that's what we need to do as well. One last point for me. Did it again. For me. Um, one, as a, somebody who's interested in the early modern period uh, and teaching in a design school, and design schools tend to be presentist, to be honest. Um, one of the great issues for me is to return to this question of the synchronic versus the diachronic. Um, this finds origins, of course, in linguistic analysis, so sûr, if you want. There's a synchronic dimension or the premise that language is an assembly of signs that can be understood as a total system at a given moment. So it works this way. And then there is the diachronic plane of things, which is an evaluation of the temporal development of language. And that is necessary to understanding its systemic logic. You have this. Right? Structuralism obviously leading to post-structuralism is based on this. The condition is transposed, actually, I would argue, to our current moment right now. Um, and that the notion of a global expanse of geography itself, as opposed to an unfolding in time, it doesn't need to be that way, but that's in effect what has happened, at least pedagogically. So where the history, and I'm going to wrap it up, where the history, oops. Where the history and theory of our own design disciplines are concerned, it seems clear that uh, the Eurocentrists we love to hate, Winkelmann, Gibbon, Hegel, those who package a racist and, and imperializing Eurocentrism only to in, impose the kind of deep structure of analysis, the rise and fall, the rise and decline of civilization. There's a, there is a point in time and a point geographically that they all go to. So in fact, they keep the, the, the synchronous and the diachronic going. I can point right towards it. It's behind me. It's a historico-geographical juncture uh, separating Occident from Orient and their minds, all the while signaling the downfall of civilization and through the Roman Empire. And that is Diocletian's palace. It's both a city. It's a, it's a city. It's a, a, a uh, a palace, and for the historian Edward Gibbon, the very architectural slash urban emblem of decadence. Quote, the awful ruins of Spolatro are not less expressive of the decline of architecture than the Roman Empire in the time of Diocletian. Bam. Um, by the same token, the call for globalism, uh, at least in my experience, and I acknowledge that it's limited, has tended to uh, be tied to an intractably presentist attitude. Um, and I have, you know, I'm looking at Mafuz. Mafuz took BTC and wrote a paper on Inigo Jones. And I was so thrilled because there's an argument to be made that there's less published on Inigo Jones than on Istanbul. Um, and, you know, your book has much to do with the sort of uh, visibility and importance of that. Um, but the, this, there has been, all I want to say, is a concomitant erasement, uh, erasure of this investment in historical depth and in the kinds of practices that were splintered and that Lynn Hunt describes. Um, and I am going, I think, to stop there. I guess that's what I'll, that's what I want to say. this. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I realize I'm the ultimate foreigner um, here, um, but thank you, nevertheless. I don't know about that. <laughs> Cornell is a pretty uh, highfalutin, okay. Hermes-like school as well. Uh, but we'll as Ezra and I and Mary Lou were saying, we're the three outsiders except and Mary Lou and I both went here, so uh, <laughs> the only outsider outsider. <laughs> All right.
so um, I'm here to present how I approach my own course, Global History of Architecture, uh, to the incoming undergraduate and graduate students uh, at Cornell in the Department of Architecture. Given the topic, I thought that might be um, appropriate. Um, but that, as I was preparing my talk, uh, my, eye, my eyes got fixed on the word versus in the poster, I guess like everyone else, uh, a term uh, defined for two opposing parties in the court of law or sports contests. And when I saw the Harvard fault lines yesterday, I started getting really scared. Um, but nevertheless, I'm still here. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, I think uh, this is a timely choice of words, uh, especially at this moment in history. Uh, when some of us find ourselves having to defend more forcefully the basic values and civil liberties uh, that should have been long established without reservations, it's no coincidence that this word enters our daily vocabulary uh, more frequently than before. Trump administration versus American Civil Liberties Union, travel bans versus immigrant rights, state violations of academic freedom versus scholars at risk foundations, and my recent favorite, Hocus Pocus versus Focus, uh, in art historian's uh, <laughs> occupation of MoMA last month. Um, so there's no question that I see myself on the side uh, of defending an architectural history that is building toward global justice. Uh, than crediting white male architects only. Uh, on the other hand, I can't continue too long with this polarization of the canon and global history, not because I don't think there needs to be a significant revision of the way we teach architectural history, um, but rather because this polarization would limit some conversation. So first, such a polarization may make us assume that there are only two models which is hardly the case, as I will um, speak in a minute. Second, it may fail to register some of the contradictions in some of the initiatives uh, recently undertaken in the name of global history. Um, how could we possibly settle on the conclusion uh, that architectural establishment, which has so far been tight-fisted in opening its journal pages, faculty positions, or scholarly attention to architectures outside Europe and North America in modern um, histories, which has so far earned little credibility or labored in minor previous experience uh, in these areas, can suddenly claim to have found the formula of global history. Third, such a polarization perpetuates some of the assumptions about global history by way of its assumed difference from the canon, as if a global architectural history is a shallow extension over geographical space rather than historical depth, as if it necessarily circumnavigates the entire planet, as if it necessarily excludes the current canon, and as if it could not have a canon of its own. However, global history may choose to decanonize the history of architecture or define a canon uh, in a more globalized way. Moreover, the global history that I would like to present today can be written, I think, deeply um, about one artifact alone, as long as it explains this artifact with both the local and the global forces acting on it. So um, interest, I'm less interested, in a way, in completing history than making it more relevant. Uh, so even though introductory courses of architectural history, I think, still hold an indispensable place in professional education, I don't think we can just assume that we don't need to teach an introductory history to, in professional education. So it, I think I, I will start with this premise that it, they are, um, they do hold an important place in professional education. Um, but the surveys uh, that um, we have been teaching have long relied on this conceptual schema that lend to the monophonic and monochronic narrative prioritizing white male architects. Most of us teaching history theory and criticism in architecture today may find ourselves in need of uh, unteaching the survey uh, in subsequent classes to open space for the convincing critiques related, uh, raised in recent years by postcolonial feminists or critical race studies. Um, at the same time, however, there's a recent tendency uh, to write the global history of architecture by perpetuating art history's 19th century field categories such as Islamic architecture, Asian architecture, Chinese architecture, or modern with a capital M as if it happened only in Europe and North America, much like the Western versus non-Western divide or the clash of civilizations theory. This model conceives and separates the world into a few self-contained and isolated geographical entities. Uh, it is therefore, I think, too vulnerable to maintaining the same geopolitical schema that produced the traditional canon in the first place. So the criticality of global history today, I think, is to be measured by its resistance to turning the clash of civilizations theory into a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
um, the global Okay, uh, the global history of architecture um, that I teach at Cornell University uh, tries to uh, offer a model that is actually against these two positions. Uh, and uh, this, it does draw on the translation theory uh, of my book, Architecture and Translation, or at least that is how I arrived on this model. So in this book, uh, Architecture and Translation, I argue that there is enough evidence to rewrite the past in a much more intertwined way uh, than what conventional categories allow for. And um, I tried to develop a theory of translation as well as its related vocabulary to explain the global movement of architecture. Recent theories uh, have presented countless reasons to reject the conventional notion of translation as a neutral bridge between cultures or a second-hand copy that fabricated the myth of the original. When translation is defined as the process of transformation that takes place with the transportation from one or more places of another, uh, of people, of ideas, of uh, images, of objects, technologies, information. So when architect translation is defined as the process of transformation that happens uh, with the transportation from one or more places to another people, I think uh, it gives us a good model uh, to start writing a another global history of architecture, and it's because it avoids passive metaphors, and I think it also avoids depoliticized explanations. So it has a um, potential to um, um, account for the agency of all parties in cross-geographical vectors. Uh, so the model um, for the global, or the word I prefer is intertwined, uh, the model for intertwined history that comes out of this translation theory would present a much more connected world. Uh, for an introductory class of such a global history, I do not necessarily propose to smoothly and efficiently circumnavigate the whole planet by using a grand narrative explanatory framework in a universalizing fashion, but to focus on interconnections between parts of the world. So I'll be showing basically slides of, uh, from um, the introduction of my class. I mean, these are the slides that I show to the students in the very first day. So like an ever-growing but perpetually incomplete additive mo mosaic rather than a top-down panoramic gaze that discards altered and incommensurability, such a history concentrates on some points. That point can be a building, an architect, or a movement of a, in a certain time and place. Uh, and these points uh, are uh, organized roughly chronologically and more evenly distributed geographically. And these points can be connected in multiple ways. So in this framework, uh, each of these points is discussed in detail, both in relation to their immediate context and from a global perspective by tracing uh, the translations uh, from several places that act on it. And uh, the evenly uh, or more evenly distributed points uh, and their given connections together start making a mosaic of the world without creating a perception uh, that they are self-contained or isolated entities, and without zooming out from one allegedly original place into bigger territories. Namely, this mosaic demonstrates how the world is intertwined. Places are affected by each other, uh, even when they are segregated. Architectures are reciprocally translated rather than disseminated from one center as if the rest was purely derivative. Whether there was a peaceful or violent, collaborative or competitive, espousing or defined conversation, an intertwined history perceives each location in a given time and place in some relation to other locations. So in this class, uh, which is, I should have said, it's um, from 1750 to the present, um, it's a quite standard periodization. Um, but in this class, I include works that are distributed more evenly around the globe. And I discuss them both from the perspective of the canon and from critical perspectives, including the uh, viewpoints of an economic uh, injustice, feminism, critique of imperialism, and critique of racism, and so on. So I want to give you a few examples of the session so that this becomes a little bit more concrete. Um, for instance, the week on the global network of revolutions, which is quite early, I mean, it's, um, the um, week. Uh, the second uh, lecture, um, the week on the global network of revolutions would be a good example here, where I discuss the French, American, and Haitian revolutions together. Uh, the assumption that the world is divided into a few distinct civilizations has been used to justify the postulation that modernity was an exclusively European uh, invention which disseminated to the rest of the world and thereby erased other presumably frozen architectural cultures, or at least rendered them unworthy of scholarly study. Uh, 
And I think nowhere is this claim as firmly posited as in the narratives that show purely uh, Western origins for the inventions of people's sovereignty during the Enlightenment revolutions and the foundations of modern sociopolitical and legal order. It's a curious fact that many histories mention French and American revolutions separately as big leaps of humanity, as benchmarks of self-governance and popular sovereignty, but they hardly spare a word for other people's revolutions that were happening simultaneously, such as the declaration of the Hating Constitution in 1801. The French, American, and Haitian revolutions, would, uh, which founded republics based on values such as freedom, equality, and human and citizen rights, could indeed, I think, be discussed together as a global network of people's revolutions that took place during similar years. And additionally, established surveys, as you know, from buttress triumphalist narratives failing to confront uh, some of the hypocrisies of these revolutions, the status of slavery, exposes such contradiction within the American Revolution, and the, which makes the Haitian Revolution precisely an important point in the global history of um, humanity. The Haitian Revolution is a marker of human history precisely because it was the first constitution to both declare people's sovereignty and abandon slavery. Um, so I can't imagine that we don't register for the first constitution that abandoned slavery um, as an important chronological marker. And the architectural symbols of these revolutions exist within a similar hierarchy. When one looks at the architectural symbols of Fre French Revolution, or when one is um, teaching a, um, a global history class about it, I think one would think of Soufflot's um, Saint Genevieve's transformation to Pantheon in the hands of Catherine de Cancy is becoming a monument to the French Revolution. While thinking of the American Revolution in architectural terms, one could immediately reflect on the University of uh, Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. But when, uh, one would be short of buildings if one were to discuss the Haitian Revolution with architectural examples, as these are barely researched or recognized in the discipline. The San Susi Palace in Milo, uh, under Henry Christophe's rule, uh, which is in ruins today, is one such e example, waiting for more scholarly attention and exploration into its direct or indirect relations to thinkers such as Toussaint Louverture, among others. So, in other words, teaching an intertwined architectural history that shows the co or that shows uh, the relation between the French, American, and Haitian revolutions uh, is therefore, I think, much more than a whimsical gesture, uh, but a breaking down of a symbolic system that has maintained uh, the uh, more established uh, history uh, or survey. And I think one could indeed extend this intertwined uh, history uh, to many sessions when discussing the Industrial Revolution. For instance, the class not only looks at the impact of new materials, technologies, and mass production on the architecture in London, Paris, and Chicago, but also discusses the strong uh, cause and effect relations between industrialization and colonization in India and North Africa. Uh, Crystal Palace is not only a benchmark of transparency, new modular construction techniques, and the rise of the machine, but also through its displays, it's also a benchmark for the de Orientalist divide between the progress West and the underdeveloped East, perceived to be in need of Western civilization. So a geopolitically, maybe I shouldn't have put uh, this one because it's a, um, obviously a problematic map, but nevertheless, I think it uh, visualizes uh, several things uh, quite um, well. I mean, a geopolitically conscious global history, I think, would show um, the togetherness of industrialization and colonial expansion. Or an intertwined history of Art Nouveau in Belgium, France, Spain, Austria, and Ottoman Empire, or the impact, uh, instant impact of Bauhaus as a school in India would give the evidence of traveling theories and form-making principles. A global history of modern houses would allow us to observe the emergence of modernism throughout the work, not only uh, with the, throughout the world, through the work of not only Le Corbusier, Mies, and Frank Lloyd Wright, but also Juan O'Gorman, Seda uh, Dadem, Sutemi Haraguchi, um, and um, gender inequality uh, and feminism can be discussed through exceptional houses and household technologies uh, designed um, by Eileen Gray and Margareta Schutelowski, not only in, in Austria and Germany, but also Turkey. Women's key influence in the development of modernism can be observed through houses of not only Rietveld and Schroeder, but also Frida Kahlo. Uh, the participation of space uh, in segregating women can be analyzed in houses of not only Adolf Loos, but also Seyfi Arkan. And um, maybe I don't need to tell about 
everything, um, but the competing, uh, just to give more examples, the competing visions of tall buildings and housing in the Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc during the Cold War era would relativize each other uh, and modernism in the new independent nation states, uh, dissolving from the Ottoman Empire in the West Asia or the end of British colonization in Indian Peninsula would complicate uh, the, uh, our assumptions of, about the makers of modernism. So one of the indispensable components of this class uh, are the seminars on stage, uh, where master students make a presentation on a building or architect of their choice in front of an audience of undergraduate and graduate students. The semi-transparent red dots that you see on this map is um, you know, indicating some of their choices. There are uh, several uh, seminars on stage, but I'm showing you an, um, uh, only one of them. So in this way, uh, the MRC students decide who gets additionally included uh, in this class. And in this way, it's not only the teacher, but also the students who together shape the content of this class. Uh, so the seminars on stage indicate both the participatory content of this class and also the necessarily incomplete and open state of a global history of architecture today. Let me therefore conclude by elaborating on the fourth reason that makes me take the verses in today's title cautiously. One would use the word verses only in conditions where an equal and fair competing field is at least imaginable however deviated from the ideal it might be and usually is. For instance, one would not dare say refugees versus states after Hannah Arendt or George Agamben, as if stateless people could possibly have an equal chance against their states who stripped them of their human rights in the first place. So the global history classes that we teach are unavoidably limited by the scholarship and translations that currently exist which are themselves generated in and published by institutions that have long blocked it, its chances. So for example, the lack of architectural scholarship for the Haitian Revolution in comparison to the French and American exposes the current, the current unachievability of a global history. Uh, I'm not saying the perpetual unachievability, but in a context full of unsayables, I think one could therefore hardly say canon versus global history. Thank you. All right, um, before opening up fully to questions, I just want to uh, highlight one, th make explicit, make more kind of brutally explicit, I think one thing that uh, both Ezra and Erica raised um, that presumably we all know, um, that in many ways the, the canon global history debate within design schools is, is proxy for an ethical argument, right? So that we're not really, we're talking much less about an argument about knowledge, what do we need to know about, than we're talking about an ethical position that, that in some ways is being uh, pushed forward by design students who are concerned with their own um, participation in a discipline and, and then their participation in a discipline that either looks on itself or looks outward and does so in different ways. And so when we talk about a canonical history and we talk about a global history, we're simply using proxy terms for a discipline that is reflecting on itself and its own professionalism, its own techniques, or we're thinking about a discipline that is looking outward and is engaged in the world. And so many of the, the pressures on a global history course are to answer um, the desire by design students, but also by undergraduate students more generally, to understand how particular aspects of knowledge and discipline <coughs> are relevant, are participatory in these larger frameworks. So as, as Erica and Ezra spoke, actually one of the possibilities that became clearer to me that I hadn't registered before was we might, rather than take the the, the kind of conventional idea of the ethics here lying in questions of content, what is represented by our courses, what kind of content do we teach? We could think perhaps in our discussion here about the ethics being manifest in the method of these courses. And, and what I mean is that, that Ezra has put on the table the, the, the a historical method of translation, of bringing forward regardless of content, regardless of the specific cases being took, taken um, uh, a method based on translation or mosaic, a kind of historiographic mm -hmm. method or historical method that would reveal to a student, that would reveal to other scholars um, a, a particular moment in a particular way, and that the, the, the method itself would be um, something we could talk about as a kind of ethics of, of historical work. And then similarly, the question of depth is recovery of depth. Um, this might be a way to, uh, if we think of that as a method, 
Um, so rather than uh, returning to a certain kind of content, think of that as a technique or method of history. Could we say that there's a that what you via via Hunt are revealing is the possibility that rather than the return to depth always being a movement from case to generality, where generality stands for universality, um, that we might be, you might be proposing a, a method of depth where case to generality doesn't imply universality, right? But it provides a particular kind of explanation of relativization, or in Ezra's term, it relativizes things vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis one another. So, and this is to take Mary Lou's point from yesterday about case to generality and the need to see that as one of these kind of essential how-tos of, of historical work. So anyway, it's so a first proposition, but, but I'm opening to questions. Um, maybe we can just be blunt about the fact that we're talking about an ethics of historical work in the context of architecture schools and the academy. Um, but rather than immediately default to the idea that we're talking about content and who is represented in our historical stories, we could also ask ourselves, since we're all kind of concerned with history as research and teaching, we could say, what is the ethics of the methods that we're bringing in these different kind of situations? And talk. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, to the two speakers. Um, I'm glad you reacted to the verses, uh, <laughs> because I, I think this was actually, uh, yes, it's a disputable. Uh, the verses is perfectly disputable, and you've shown it both brilliantly. I, I still think that, you know, there is another question, which is causality. That's to say, if you remain within, you know, a, a certain kind area, et cetera, causality is relatively simple. In your case, Ezra, I think, you know, this idea of translation functions quite beautifully with a certain number of situations. And I'm very convinced, that actually, the reason I thought about getting you here is because I was really struck by you presented your class when I was in Cornell. And I think it's, it's great to have that. But then I'm wondering, you know, what kind of causality translation is one, but it's much more complex, for example, to use vis-a-vis uh, -vis other, before, for example, 1750. It's, re it's more complex in certain ways uh, when you deal with more remote period. And what kind of other types of causality? I mean, you know, when you begin to, to, to make relation, it means that these relations have somewhere a root. You see what I mean? And they're justified. And what you said actually reminded me a lot of Baxendel methodological point about, you know, do not put things together without finding mediation from one to another, mm -hmm. which is really in patterns uh, of, of intention. You know, one of the thing you really retain from this book, and I think your course brilliantly, you know, illustrates, I think, this methodological point. But are there other patterns uh, or causal a factor we could mobilize for a global history in order that we don't juxtapose a pagoda and a Greek temple, et cetera, is for me uh, an open question. So um, I have a question for Ezra. Um, I, I was very taken by your presentation. I think you made a number of compelling arguments, very beautifully articulated as well. Um, but but I, because I'm sympathetic, I want to I wanna push back. Um, and particularly it, in that moment when um, you present the overall course as a world map and you specify that you particularly don't want to start in any one spot. Um, and, and while I understand the intentions and the motivation behind that move, um, to me it seems to take away from part of what any history or historian necessarily depends on, which is to say the starting, the, the, the grounding of oneself within a certain place and time and set of discussions and questions and assumptions. Um, <coughs> So, because of course we are, we are not a community, as you know, as much as maybe we would like to be, we're not a community of uh, uh, space station uh, bred humans who, you know, <laughs> have a, a universal language and culture. Um, so, so in, in some ways to, 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 to deny starting from, you know, a certain, at least, you know, whether I don't, I, you know, I, the, that decision could be subjective. One could say, well, maybe one starts with Ithaca. Uh, uh, New York, or someone starts somewhere else. I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying that 
there's a, a right way, a right place to start. But to begin somewhere seems important to me to, to accept that kind of precondition. And I'd just like to, um, I, I know I've, I've been long, but just tag on to this. Um, again, even though I, I'm very sympathetic to many of, for example, Jonathan Mathi Massey's claims, similar claims, about uh, the, 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 the need to displace the, uh, uh, the, the, the dominance of privileged white men in uh, the kind of the subjects that, that we study. At the same time, I think it would be completely um, a, a fantasy to imagine that much of uh, modern architecture, uh, in, in the broad sense, from you know roughly 1750 to today, was not largely shaped by privileged white men for all their differences of a certain kind of uh, you know place and uh, and geographical uh, uh, unity of you know again despite all the differences. Um, so I, again, I understand the ethical imperative, but uh, there's a danger of uh, shooting ourselves in the foot when we want to try to address that imperative, I think. Um, so, so I don't think uh, I deny the um, importance of starting. So, I mean, even if when you go to in front of the classroom, I mean, you are starting. But the point that I was making, making is that the starting point uh, is not the origin, necessarily. There might be several starting points. Uh, and um, the fact that um, um, in each uh, lecture, there are there's actually um, more than one uh, content being discussed, and their relations um, 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 bet the relations between them is being uh, discussed uh, is uh, about multiplying uh, the starting points rather than uh, taking one starting point as an original. So I don't know if that um, answers your question. And the other thing, um, the second point that you were making, um, let me uh, get this. You, you did uh, say that it's impossible to deny that white male male men uh, made canon. Yeah, that's that's true. So uh, in a way, the but how do we teach it uh, is uh, the question that we are having. I mean, this is not about denying that white male men made uh, most of the world as is, but having a critical view to it is, is part of the way that we, we can teach it, I think. And um, so white men or like some establishment did not only make history, but it also made historiography. I mean, the way we write history. Uh, and in that sense, um, the erasure of um, as important uh, moments in history, like the Haitian Revolution or many other things, is, I think, uh, um, one example of that. So uh, in our classes, at least, we don't need to maintain uh, that uh, establishment. We can look at it critically. And uh, at the same time, uh, it's important that as historians, we bring out um, moments or episodes uh, where um, it was the historiography's um, um, act uh, that erased uh, the uh, important uh, figures of the past, and at least as historians, we can reclaim that. Um, I want to uh, follow up a little bit. Um, uh, the first is uh, I want to put up my PowerPoint because um, one of the one of the places Antoine and I are actually co-teaching the second part of Buildings Text Context. If you go, yeah, go down. Stop there. Um, it's interesting that actually uh, we, we are trying in a much, much less, I, I would say, systematic way, uh, and we are still fumbling in the dark about this, but we are very much trying to make these kinds of connections, translations, contradictions happen within the course. And I'm showing uh, behind you one of the places where that is happening. Um, it's hard, as Antoine always says in his lecture on Logier, not to mention Logier and that frontispiece yet again. Um, but it's interesting that uh, uh, the slide on the right shows you an enterprise that is contemporaneous with it, which is obviously a, um, a uh, comes from a book, uh, which is essentially the plan for the rustic hut or a plantation in French Guinea. And so that is part of the course. And there's a, there's, a, there's a link there that we can make, which is very specific, which has to do with enlightenment debates, a Bérénal, whoever, um, and the kinds of uh, uh, sort of uh, figuration of colonialism in that period and a sort of, um, you could stick in the salt works next to this, but this is a, a production of 
sugar. At any rate, um, the other thing is that I actually do think you had a starting point. Um, you mentioned, oh, it's standard, 1750 to the present. Well, yeah, it's standard. It's taught at MIT that way. Or I don't know if it still is, but it was when I was there. Um, I always wonder about that date, 1750. Um, but you actually started with revolution, and I think that matters. Um, I think it matters that you began your narrative today with the question of revolution, because these are the moments when uh, revolution is a return, but it's also a break. Uh, these are moments of rupture. These are moments that redefine translations uh, and networks, uh, create new ones. So I actually do think you had a point of departure. Let me yeah. just, just make sure we don't <clears throat> miss questions, um, if there are any first. OK, I'll just get them lined up. OK, but Ezra, if you'd like to respond to that, uh, and then we'll do No, I mean, my point was that uh, the starting point is a multiple point in, uh, in world map. That was, that was my point. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a, um, a question about fan fiction, actually. Uh, or, <laughs> um, I know, I Or, well, oh uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering right? how the, the, the cases, let's say, mm -hmm. are chosen. Um, I, I like this, uh, your, your son's idea of the, the canon in relationship to fan fiction, right? If we're, if we're thinking about maybe the end result of all of this, uh, of uh, being um, what students being able to tell their own stories, right? Um, and you know, in order to do that, you need a sort of fixed, some fixed, some gr agreed upon points of departure that allow it to be sort of readable or situatable within a universe of other people who are interested in the same stories, right? And you know, you can um, within this sort of uh, world, you can you can. You can choose whether it's sort of Batman or Harry Potter, or you can choose the canon you want to work with. Also, um, I, I wonder what the what the it, it might seem to be that the um, the canon is not so much the problem, or right the um, I mean everybody would you know uh, fixed points of departure are being sort of created either way, whether it's yeah, um, and the the real question is how you're sort of um, reverse engineering from the, st the stories that, let's say, the students want to tell and giving them the points of departure that will let them tell it. Um, and, and so, you know, exactly which the case studies are, whether it's sort of revolution and then X, Y, Z or something else, then becomes sort of the most important point. Um, yeah. When it returns a bit then to the question of disciplinary knowledge, because the, the, the construction of either starting point or the construction of a kind of uh, body of fans, right? You, you're, it's not just what story do you want to tell, but you're making a decision to uh, create a common language among students at the GSD. Or is it a common language between students of the GSD and Toronto, and that they'll be able to actually communicate and, and then continue to communicate as practitioners? Or is it a dialogue between those students and a lay public? Right. So the, the fan question, I think it's a useful metaphor for thinking through the construction of audience as a um, calibration of profession and public in some ways, and thinking of you know creating um, I think that there have been, historically, in architectural pedagogy, successful moments of creating these really kind of hot houses of orchids that survive nowhere else in the world, right? And so you, you can graduate people from Princeton uh, who simply can't communicate with anybody who didn't go to Princeton when I was there, right? There was a, there's a kind of hot house environment. Um, and then there are other attempts to create much more kind of generalized knowledges. So there are pros and cons, I assume. But maybe that's the way to think of the fan structure is not just what do we want what dialogue do we want to have with our students, but who do we want our students to be able to uh, assemble as their cohort of fans? Yeah, I mean, the difficulty of answering uh, which um, buildings or which case studies uh, you include uh, in the course, uh, that, you know, that's true for a very traditional survey course and for a global history course as well. So that, um, but, N nevertheless, I think there is a difference uh, between being curious uh, about the world and not being curious about the world. So I, in that sense, I don't think uh, you can um, just uh, use that 
uh, argument that you are also cho choosing case studies as an uh, argument against global uh, history. And, and in that sense, I think it's also um, important uh, to acknowledge um, the uh, openness and unfinishedness uh, of, um, of the classes that we are teaching uh, today. And for that reason, I think this um, seminars on stage is one way of I th um, acknowledging that and having uh, the students um, pick some of the uh, content of the, this class, so it makes it more participatory. And I, I would perhaps go back to the fourth point. I mean, there are still several things that are unsayable uh, because the there's no scholarship. I mean, we, yeah. um, and the uh, institutions of um, architectural history is blocking that um, scholarship. So we don't even know what we are not saying. So it's important to acknowledge that too. So I think, um, we do need to uh, start, or maybe I shouldn't have used that word, but uh, we do need to acknowledge uh, the open uh, and unfinished uh, nature of global history, even if uh, we could Im include all the case studies that we know, that would still be a very incomplete. Um, we have a question at the back, and then. Um, yeah, so this might connect to the way you organize the classroom. Um, but I was curious if um, this impulse to level the marginal and the canonical um, runs the risk of perhaps uh, reinforcing um, a patriarchal culture of monumentalization and of perhaps what, what an anti-monumental sort of um, history of architecture might look like? Do you think that's a presentist position, to go back to your no, I mean, concern I'll, about I'll the go presentism back. I'll, of the I'll, I'll, I'll go back right there. Um, and one of the things that I've always been interested, for example, is iconoclasm um, and the public sphere. That's literally the destruction of things um, and political and collective action. I think you know it's interesting uh, that there's a student who just defended a dissertation at Columbia on the Haitian Revolution. Um, certainly, I think art historians, thinking of Darcy uh, Grigsby at Berkeley, have written books called Extremities. Um, I think there's a this has been going on now for a while, and it's a very, very good thing. I, you know, I don't think it's a presentist position at all. One can go back uh, deep in time, medieval period, uh, Cordoba. Uh, you can go back to the Inquisition. We can think of all sorts of places where violence, exclusion, uh, the collision and clashing of civilizations occur. I think that has a deep history and. We do need to try to foreground it. I don't think it's a present disposition. So, uh, question here, and then Ed, I'll get you after. Um, I was just going to sort of introduce a historical anecdote. Uh, you know, in the 19th century, uh, the uh, British Empire in India, one of the ways in which they displaced local rulers was by sort of positing like a deep sort of monumental Indian history that Indians were being inadequate caretakers of, right? Like they weren't taking care of their architecture. They weren't taking care of their sites. Um, and this was something that was reproduced around the world sort of throughout the 19th century. And one of the problems that a f sort of a first generation of global history, sort of like the first gen, you could argue that like philology, right? Like sort of like British philology in the 1920s and 30s was like the first attempt at this sort of global sort of um, history. One of the problems that scholars ran into was uh, that they ended up reproducing um, the sort of institutional agendas of the of the universities that were sort of in Britain. <laughs> so, uh, so if you went to to sort of dig in the dig in the archives to produce a history of say Indian architecture, and you ended up going to like the University of Calcutta, the types of professors that were there were largely educated at Oxford and Cambridge. If you and and that's why when I look at those maps, like like for instance, what was done at MIT, I see sort of a almost like a by rote sort of mapping of colonial, colonial centers of institutional knowledge. So you talk about um, Laila Bella in Ethiopia, or you, you end up looking at Al-Azhar in Egypt, you end up looking at Mali, you end up looking at, and these are, these are, these are things that I think haven't been, that, that we haven't entirely disentangled ourselves from. And so I'm curious, just kind of methodologically in your course, how you sort of avoid that avoid that sort of thing, you know? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it 
uh, the two questions, I, I do find them related about uh, an architectural history that's not about the monuments. And um, there was, um, I mean, in the perhaps one trajectory of uh, the post-colonial discourse, um, um, the um, w one trajectory wanted to decanonize history, I mean, by in introducing um, buildings not done by architects, non-monuments, and so on. So uh, I, I do have a lot of respect for that uh, trajectory, but uh, I also uh, do um, um, appreciate the criticism that uh, came uh, to that discourse that um, for while teaching professional architects, if uh, we are also teaching what lessons um, to be learned uh, from history, sometimes uh, teaching uh, the um, buildings that don't have to be monuments, they can be very, um, you know, it can be also vernacular architecture, it doesn't have to be very monumental, but teaching uh, or bringing um, examples uh, that uh, do um, that do allow the architects to um, participate in the discussion is important. So only, in a way, I, um, one of the things uh, that I feel that trajectory of post-colonial discourse did was to make the separation uh, that makes us think there's canon and the global history are separated. I mean, as if, if you are teaching global history, you are completely disregarding the canon. So the verses, I think, uh, is a product of that trajectory of post-colonial uh, discourse. Um, so in that sense, for that reason, I do want to bring back um, the global history that actually uh, can um, produce a, a canon in a more globalized way. That is also global history. Um, but that doesn't necessarily undo uh, the, um, the contribution of this first trajectory of post-colonial th um, theory. I, mean, I, I think I worry that, um, again, you mentioned earlier, like, I think there's always this worry that like translation is the front lines mm -hmm. of like post-colonial activity, right? Translation is incredibly fraught mm -hmm. um, and, and problematic and, and sort of the methodologies mm -hmm. of translation reproduce other forms of well, sort of so so that's why I'm asking. It, it's not the verses so much as that global history is potentially mm -hmm. just canonization by other let me just let Ed um, ask but, his question. I mean, I have to kind of, um, because I can't just let that go. I mean, uh, there are, um, you, you know, there are several theories of translation. I mean, Sorry. translation in the conventional sense is, of course, fraud. But um, it's uh, your approach to the theory of translation that matters. It's not really translation as one single thing. Um, and as I said, I mean, global history can uh, canonize things in a more globalized way. Uh, and there are. Um, models of global history that decanonize history. Right? I think both of them exist. Uh, so that's why I think uh, the verses uh, makes us think that there are two models, which is not the case. I mean, which model you choose, uh, or may probably it's the hybrid of both several uh, models, is um, something that I, I would expect uh, many individuals would go forward. But mm -hmm. global history doesn't necessarily decanonize the canon. Um, it might also. Just jump to two seconds. I'm wondering sometimes you criticize the verses whether mm -hmm. the global is actually a good term because the global goes with the idea that it's more complete, etc. Or mm -hmm. it's not actually a quantitative jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually a so I'm wondering whether actually it's not the term itself is all novel. So this is no problem. Yeah, I mean that's why I prefer intertwined history. Um, exactly. But whenever I mean at the same time it's just in. The side yeah, in a, on the other hand, when I say intertwined history, it's less communicated, uh, and I find myself less um, ease, uh, able to um, hook into conversations. So in that sense, global history is now like a shortcut. I mean, it has different uh, meanings uh, for um, different individuals, but nevertheless, it is a conversation. So in order to uh, enter the conversation, I am happy to use global history, but then the second sentence immediately has to become what I mean by global history, which is more like an intertwined history rather than a globalizing history or rather than something that circumnavigates the whole planet. <laughs> I, yeah, I, if my comments sound defensive, I'll explain why in a second, but two, two, two quick comments. One is, 
I want to mention that in my landscape course, for example, the entire first half of the semester is devoted to the question of, of translation. But this is in the traditional sense of translation literally as tradition. The words are synonymous. And we talk about translatio imperi. And yes, while we might go afield, so to speak, to India, Asia, Persian gardens, what have you, what I'm talking about there is the diachronic persistence of a set of meanings that had to have been passed along over time. And the precise name for that is traditio, or translation. So there's a way in which one could amplify and uh, insulate the field through translation that's not in the geographic sense you're describing. But the second, as I said, the reason I say defensive is, for all that's been said about uh, verses or not verses, I, I do feel like you've created a verses. You, you said, well, here's a way of operating, and everyone else is operating this way, and there are no opportunities for doing this set. I just don't see the field that way, and I'll be very quick about it. I mean, as someone who, of need, is on the job market, looking at the job listings constantly, I dare you to find a job in the most specialized field in Renaissance history. Italian Renaissance history does not say at the final line, special, uh, uh, desirable um, to have insight into global whatever, world architecture, world history, what have you. It's not an accessory feature of the field. It is the guiding dimension of the field. And I would suggest that the discourse has, and not even recently, for a fairly long period of time now, been to, a, to some people an exhaustive ex insistence on precisely this idea. So the verse doesn't quite work for me, and um, which I think is being postulated here. At the same time, it's being undermined. And I should just say, I'll shut up with this. But, <laughs> You know, for the people you would least expect it, I give two separate lectures on Toussaint Louverture, one in my landscape course, one in my architecture course, using two distinctly set different sets of historiography. Now, I'm the enemy in the story. I'm the guy you're verse against, believe me. But I think it's, it's within the field. And to kind of pretend as a rallying cry that it's being excluded, it, it's not an effective argument for me, at least. But that's why I'm provoked. Yeah, but um, I think my point was that there are definitely contradictions in the name of global history. I mean, I think um, suddenly uh, institutions that think they can um, turn, um, I mean, I, I'm saying my course is just, it's very unfinished. I mean, I'm uh, giving you a very uh, weak, uh, unfinished course description. Uh, so, but I also um, find it very contradictory when institutions suddenly um, claim they have turned their history classes into global, art history, global architecture history classes by using a lot of the same conceptual schema. So in that sense, uh, I mean, let's, let's admit, I mean, I don't think uh, we have. Uh, you can't speak, you are the institution. No, I'm just one, I'm presenting one model. But what I'm uh, saying is that um, I think we have to be true to ourselves that the establishment of architecture has been less curious. And we, we have very little credibility uh, in um, claiming uh, that uh, we have um, established our discipline as something that has um, enough tools to uh, understand the world. I think, um, you know. I don't think uh, it is fair to think um, that um, major um, publications in, uh, that most students read, uh, major um, <coughs> journals, uh, I don't think they have enough um, curiosity or they have shown enough curiosity um, or labored enough and earned enough credibility to claim that they, we can do a global history of architecture. So, so in that sense, I see what you um, mean um, by uh, saying that all job descriptions have this global in the title. But I think it's a, uh, it's more um, a, um, uh, yeah, that that doesn't necessarily um, represent uh, a true um, notion of global. I mean, it's more like a show rather than a. Uh, than a Melanie, and then someone. Okay, so. Um, to tap onto what Ed and Mafus have, um, they both sort of been saying about the global versus the canon. Well, um, I think it might be interesting to think of examples where uh, sort of the canon has been operating in a very similar way to um, global history. And what I mean by that is like, Eric gave that example of the Chinese well versus the, versus the Roman impluvium, right? But 
But then in the way that we talk about Mises Seagram as being classical is that analogy. Yes, it's not the distinct non-West versus West, but it, there is sort of an operation that we go through that is similar between the canon and the global history thing. That's the one thing. And then the second thing is like Fischer von Erlach, right, who you introduced me to. So late 18th century fictional history in a way, or not fictional, sorry, yeah. Okay, worry, okay let's start, there we go. <laughs> but, so Fischer von Erlach, um, you know, is the so-called first world, you know, creates this first, and for the first world history of architecture. And what was really, what was sort of um, fascinating about that was, you know, he's going from the Temple of Solomon to, the, and then there's the um, Imperial Palace in Peking, Beijing, right? And and what's really, why that was so powerful for me to learn was that it sort of presents a canon that sort of accepted its own fiction, if that makes sense, because Fisher did, Fisher von Erlach did not travel to all these places, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's important to give students examples that show that show examples of the canon that has accepted its own fiction. And I think that's really powerful. It's sort of like a third degree of separate. It's like removing yourself even more because you're saying, yes, we know that the canon is problematic, but the canon has also accepted that it is problematic through its own history because there is a fictional element of how history is, how history is being done or world history is being done. Um, my, my comment goes uh, maybe a little bit back, a little bit in the conversation here, to um, this, this matter of ethics um, in regards to architectural education. What is the responsibility of an instructor of architecture um, today? And there's a, um, for a very long time, there's been somewhat of a presumption, and I'm going to just claim this as my own. Um, kind of interpretation that the instructor in the school of architecture or teaching in a master's of architecture or BR program is there to ensure that yes that emerging architectural practitioner or here at the GSD where you have a lot of courses for you know urban design and, um, kind of post-professional degrees programs that uh, you were to give them an entry point from their own positionality and which is to say that they see themselves as an architect, they have an idea of what an architect is, what the profession of architecture is, and that the, the world that we um, invite them into thinking about is to be seen through that lens, even if that we're, our, our responsibility is to broaden their, what that lens is, right? Is to broaden their understanding of how, how the profession of architecture is practiced, in different parts of the world, in different periods of time. And, and while that is a position that a lot of schools take, it is also kind of thrust the, um, the results, um, some would say the carcasses of these previous debates. So between post-colonial studies and the discipline of architecture, these previous world history initiatives, right, into the, 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 the box um, of the urban design, urban history practitioners in schools of architecture. And so all the things that don't quite fit in the, um, into whatever the new kind of methodological, historiographical model is for expanding the discipline of architectural education uh, gets shuttled because there isn't as clear of a line between you know, affordable housing uh, around the world, how it's designed by architects from the positionality of the architect that's sitting in your seat in an MR program. And so I, I just want to push back on this idea um, around how we, defi how we define what our methodological imperative must be as instructors of architecture. Um, and in relationship to how other practitioners, uh, other educators of architects see their methodological responsibilities. And so I don't know, maybe some others here who um, have a variety of teaching experiences can kind of weigh in on that. I want to respond to that before we go to Brian. Um, well, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that's very daunting 
um, about teaching these courses uh, is to address all of these issues, a kind of responsibility towards uh, the global, a kind of rigorous understanding of the context of things, a very practical understanding of the role of institutions, how they're designed, how they function, what is a prison, what is a hospital, what is a house. Um, and it's interesting as an historian to think, you know, I remember a, a lecture uh, uh, that um, on habitation. When we talk about habitation in a course like ours or like BTC, not only do we have an historical duty um, or an investigation at hand, but we also have to speak to exactly this kind of problem. So when you take Serlio's book on habitation, for example, and you look at the first, what is the basic house? It's two rooms with a window cut out so that the animal can put its head through and look at its owner. And this is the beginning of property and a house in, in the Renaissance. Um, this is very different from the kind of thing when you look at, say, uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, 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 all black towns in Oklahoma, and the kinds of grids that are uh, imposed and formalized and where housing lies in, in that context. And we're constantly, I think, we have a double burden. We have to be historians. We have to have an attitude and an ethical uh, sort of stance on history. Um, I, I wonder in, in your lectures about sort of repeating a network and how that normalizes the notion of network, lecture after lecture. Are there moments when we can foreground a network? Are there other moments where we can contextualize sort network of locally? Is or, only one uh, session. OK. Um, Not all sessions. But these sort of the, these translational mm -hmm. webs, mm -hmm. right? They're, they go from week to week. Um, and I think they're wonderful. Uh, but there's also a way in which when that method is repeated and repeated and repeated over again, sometimes it's useful to sit on, say, uh, the grids uh, of, of an all-black town in Reconstruction or, you know, Serlio's book on habitation. And I think they speak to elements of practice that are important for design students, whether they're in urban design, landscape architecture, or architecture uh, itself. So I think you know I, I you just you just uh, opened up Pandora's box about the breadth and the difficulty of pedagogy um, in design schools. Um, we're almost out of time, so Brian uh, is moving. All right. Um, so I'm wondering how much we can think of the relationship between canon and decanonization as between a noun and a verb, in the sense that decanonization is some sort of an activity that one engages in, but the idea that there's a non-canonical history that you give would, is, is maybe a bit of a paradox in itself in the fact that it's a course in an institution. Um, <clears throat> because I guess the reason I'm thinking this, Deleuze has been invoked a couple of times, so I feel like I can use him, um, <laughs> that the relationship of the major and the minor, or the relationship of the majoritarian and the minoritarian to him is one in which you can't have a minor unless there's a major that you're constantly reacting to and pulling apart. But that's, that's an activity that can't come to an end, which would be a reason to describe one of these courses as, as never finished. Because I think also, relatedly, the way Chakrabarty talks about history one and history two in provincializing Europe is that history one, every time you produce this sort of epic history of capitalism or globalization, any time you attempt to give an account of the subaltern, as soon as you make it discursive, it's no longer history too. It's no longer the non-discursive excluded. So it's a process by its, by its very nature that, it, that can't be completed, or it's a process that just continues to require activity, which then makes me think this is just a description of doing good history or trying to be a historian. Um, and that the issues play out geographically, but they also just play out in, you know, in thinking about where you come from or how the past relates to you. Antoine, did you? No, 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 no. I, I actually think that's a lovely way to end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ezra, <laughs> Erica, thank you very much.